Thanks for joining us. I'm Libby Hill here with IndieWire's Ben Travers. We are two and a half weeks out from the 2019 Emmy nominations, and we've had a little bit of time to work through our feelings. So Ben and I have gotten together to talk about what we think about these nominations. I want to start today with favorites. Ben, what made you happy Emmy nominations morning? Um, honestly, I was really happy to see all of the Barry love on Emmy nominations morning. Uh, obviously, that show has g gained a lot of popularity since its season one debut, which was received really well with the TV Academy. Um, we were expecting Bill Hader to do well again. We were expecting Henry Winkler to do well again. But Stephen Root got in, and so did Anthony Kerrigan, and now and so did Sarah Goldberg. So we've got this whole slew of Barry favorites who are gonna, you know, probably make a little bit of a run. I think. I hope. I pray. Do you have these pants in size medium? Those are women's pants. How much heat do you think Barry has going into this award season? The reason I ask is that it picked up a lot of those uh, ancillary <laughs> comedy nominations where I sort of expected Veep to have more success. Or do you just think that that is indicative of Barry just following in Veep's footsteps and taking over as top dog in comedy? Um, I, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think that this year Barry is going to do very, very well. Um, I think we're all expecting Veep to have a little bit stronger showing for its final season. I don't know if it was because there were only seven episodes this year. I don't know if it was because there was a year off. I don't know if, if it's because they just didn't quite respond to the season the way they did in the past. Um, but it does feel like Barry's got the momentum. It's got a lot more cultural chatter. Uh, it had a lot more you know, nominations overall. And I just think people are really responding to something that they were even a little bit worried about going into season two, where they're like, is this going to be able to pull off what it did in its first season? And it did pretty well. So, I, I mean, I'm feeling good about Barry. I'd love to see Veep continue to do well. But what do you think, Libby? Uh, well, I, I'm i fully on board all the Barry love. I think people are responding to it because there is a, a darkness, but also a pursuit of goodness. Um, Veep is just kind of dark, and our times right now are, are, are too dark, and maybe they're ready to transition into something new. Got so dark at the end. I know! One thing I will say is I'm so excited for that Steven Root nomination, because he is a, he is a legacy actor, he has been in the business forever, he's been on all of my favorite shows, and this is his first Emmy nomination. It's bananas. Well, what else were you excited about on Emmy morning? Like, moving on from Barry, was there anything in the other categories that really, you know... Oh, I'm a pretty normal person. A normal person? Yeah, a normal person. What makes you a normal person? Well, I don't believe in God. I love it when he does that. I was convinced that Fleabag wouldn't get any traction with the Academy just because it's so small. It's an import, and more specifically, Amazon has all of its heat tied up in Mrs. Maisel, which also did very well. It ended up with 20 Emmy nominations. But Phoebe Waller-Bridge is one of the defining voices of this uh, generation of television creators, and I think based on the success of this and the success of her other show that she created, uh, Killing Eve, I'm just happy that, that the Academy got on board before it was too late, and she went to movies and made 50 Bonds. Right, she's doing Bond now. Like it's like this. She's is, she's done with this us. This is the time to celebrate Phoebe Waller Bridge. Otherwise, you know, too late. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, I mean, it brings up another good point, which was just how refreshing it was to see so many comedies break in this year. Uh, the fact that Fleabag got in in its second season, the fact that Russian Doll made a nice run and got a huge, I mean, what, 13 nominations yeah. uh, total, like, which is a, a great haul for that Netflix show. Um, you know, it was a it was a pretty good year for turnover within the comedy race, which has been getting, uh, which has always been crowded, but it's been getting right. a little bit uh, stale over the last couple. So, um, yeah, that was nice. And still in comedy, it feels like that's the only place I was got. excited for I mean... some reason. Uh, <laughs> but I loved that that little Hulu show, Pen15, oh, yeah. scored a writing nomination in comedy writing. Um, it's such a great off kilter com coming of age comedy. Um, and it's, you know, it's women in the writer's room creating, and, and there was so much of that on Emmy morning. I was so excited, except for one big exception that broke my heart. Ben, I think, broke our collective hearts as far as women creating television, and I just brought the mood so far down, uh, but Ben, we have to talk about Emmy disappointments. Yeah, the, I mean, the disappointment on Emmy day was Pamela Adlon not only missing out on what has become a perennial, you know, nomination for Best Actress in a comedy, 
Uh, but it really felt like there was enough momentum to carry her show better things into directing, writing, maybe even series. Like, again, it was a crowded race, but this is, you know, an FX gem. It's got uh, some traction in previous years. The reviews for season three were out of this world. Um, and she's somebody who is involved in every facet of that program in such a way that it felt like you had to recognize her in more than just one category, and then the show would benefit from that, right. and it would also get attention around town. Plus, she's such a favorite within the community. Like, anybody who sees her just loses their mind right. in such a way that I can't even imagine how there weren't more, there weren't enough people checking the box to get that show more traction, and that was the most disappointing thing to see on Emmys. Right. Emmys. This is another person who's been in the industry for decades, who has worked with everyone, and everyone they work with raves about them, who mm -hmm. runs an amazing set at FX. You know, it, there's just so much going on on Better Things, and it broke my heart that it didn't break through, um, because I really felt last year it was on the verge. Yeah. It was like in that seven, eight, nine spot in series and the thought that it would just fall out, especially this year when there's so much comedy turnover, um, it was honestly unthinkable. Yeah, that was that was the biggest that was the biggest shock and also just the biggest disappointment because it felt like something you could count on for at least one little thing and then the fact that it got shut out was heartbreaking. Are you aware of the fact that you owe me an apology and you're withholding it? Or did you forget? In terms of some of the other disappointments, I mean I really would have liked to see Homecoming uh, from Amazon get a little more recognition. The fact that it was, I mean, just the fact that it was a half-hour drama competing in that category where it belongs was something where it's like, let's see the Television Academy embrace this. Uh, it's it's where things are trending. Uh, people are responding to a lot, you know, shorter programs. But also, I mean, Sam Esmail did so much with that show that's worth admiring from the direction to the cinematography to the soundtrack to the performances. Like, everything about it was built to impress, and it really came together in such a way that you'd want to honor it uh, with a lot of technical awards, if not everything overall. And then it got, like, a couple? Got, like, one for, like, sound or something? Like, it just it didn't quite hit the marks that we were hoping it would, and especially in terms of directing. And Julia Roberts, who did a fantastic job yeah. and would think the movie star status would get her over the top. Apparently not, and it's not as though drama series was so stacked, which um, is, I think, very indicative of where Homecoming ended up on people's ballots. And I do have to say, like, I'm not super surprised that the TV Academy didn't go for Homecoming because they have such issues with shows that play in genres where they don't think they belong. They don't want 30-minute dramas. They don't want hour-long comedies. They don't know what to make of them, and so they just kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I will say one thing that that actually like physically upset me was later in the morning, once I was combing through all of the nominations, all 77 pages that the TV Academy sent out, uh, seeing that David Milch missed getting a writing nomination for the Deadwood movie. Uh, really the last chance for the TV Academy to honor his work, his um, iconic work throughout all of television, and they just, they biffed it. Yeah. And I don't think that, that the writing he went up against was, was so significant. I, I honestly don't physically understand how that happened. Yeah, I feel like you're seeing, or we're seeing a lot of kind of pressure being put on those TV movies these days when they're competing against such a strong lineup of limited series. And it's so easy, I think, for voters to look at quantity when the quality yeah. is similar. So like if they like if they really liked Deadwood and they also really liked, you know, when they see us and Chernobyl and Sharp Objects and all of those limited series, they look at the limited series and like, well they did a like they did so much more. I guess I'll just check that and, and move that into the into the list. The other option is, is, you know, I mean, maybe they're thinking they're just going to honor it with the TV Movie Award and call it a day. I mean, it, it still picked up more nominations than any other TV movie by a landslide. Speaking of predictions, I hear you write some for IndieWire. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want me to start like the, the drama category and just go straight down? Because it's going to be a, a test of memory, but I can tell you that Game of Thrones is probably going to win drama series. Like, I don't want you to start with drama series. I want you to start with Variety Talk series. Variety Talk <laughs> series. Well, luckily, I think John Oliver still seems like a safe bet in Variety Talk. Uh, I hope that Samantha Bee can make a little bit of a run there, but I mean, I feel... I don't think so. It, it still seems like John Oliver's category. And we lost Seth Meyers again, so that's just, you know, the, the, the stagnation in that category makes me think it's going to continue in the winner's circle. So, Which right. is fine. He's great. I, I don't really have a problem with him winning more and the attention being paid, but also some acknowledgement of Samantha would be nice. Well, and Seth. 
Well, and, and, yeah, and let me ask you this. Like, do you feel like that category needs to be recalibrated? Um, I think they're trying their best with the, with the variety categories overall in terms of kind of stretching them out and, and separating and adding yeah. as much as they could. Like shows, you know, like James Corden and Seth Meyers and Fallon and Colbert should be competing against each other. Like that's the right realm. Right. It, should, it would just be nice again to see instead of kind of, well, I assume they're still doing the same thing every year. We'll stick with them. Like right. pay attention to what's actually being broadcast in that portion of the year and what they're trying to do. Because Myers is really trying some new stuff. Right. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I think Oliver is still pretty secure there. Yeah, I think so too. Let's move, I mean, I, I would I would contribute to that, but that category is so locked up that yeah. it's, it's mostly there to talk about our disappointments with yeah. the crop that they offered up. I am very um, interested that James Corden show was, the Late Late Show was nominated in that category. Uh, despite not being nominated for writing or directing. True. So it felt like an accessory award for um, Carpool Karaoke, which is weird because it has like seven nominations for Carpool Karaoke. Yep. But I just wanted to make sure that I said that out loud. I think the most important thing to remember with James Corden this year is the fact that um, after winning a short form video last year, right. uh, he actively campaigned and took part in Megan Amram's an Emmy for Megan. So he's now shifting his allegiances to a new contender. And I think that should really solidify, uh, you know, that ca that race. Like, it should be like, well, okay, let's pass the torch. This guy wants to do it. Keep it going. Absolutely. Let's move on. I want to know what's happening in limited series because it felt like there were several contenders making a really hard push coming up on May 31st and heading into that first round of voting. Um, what's it going to be? Is this when they see us? Is this Chernobyl? Is there someone else lurking in the shadows? Honestly, it's it's a really complicated question to answer because in, I think, traditional races, you look toward that, that nomination leader, which is Chernobyl, which is, again, somewhat surprising considering um, it came out so late and caught fired so late in the race that HBO didn't even have time to mount like a huge campaign behind it. It didn't become their primary limited series that they were pushing. It just arrived at the right time and swept up the right amount of people. Um, so now it's your leader. And at the same time, um, the widespread support for when they see us, especially in the acting categories, um, speaks to a lot of momentum there. Obviously, Netflix is going to get behind that in a huge way. Um, they still have not won in the uh, comedy, drama, or limited series category, uh, while their two biggest streaming competitors have done so. Uh, so they want to try to lock that down, and their best chance this year is going to be in limited series. So I think they're going to be spending um, a big portion of their campaign advocating for when they see us, and they've already got a lot of big name people behind it to kind of keep that relevancy alive. And the fact that they can argue for its relevancy so easily, we've seen like real world consequences come out of that show. Um, I think that's going to lend itself to a strong campaign. So I think it's a tight race right now. I, I feel like when they see us is is leading, but um, it wouldn't surprise me to see some, some upsets and especially the other categories outside of the main race. Where does that leave FX is Fosse Verton. Oh, God. I mean, Libby, you will know more than I do. <laughs> I do. I, I should say, I am the big Fosse Verdon person yeah. between the two of us. And I love it. I don't know that it has the heat that uh, either When They See Us or Chernobyl does um, in that series category. However, I will tell you, I was at the Academy screening for um, the finale, and I have never seen a reception like was given Michelle Williams. They jumped to their feet when she was introduced. I think she, I, I, I understand that the, the common uh, assumption is that Patty Arquette is going to take that category, a limited series actress, but I don't know. I think Michelle Williams is there to play spoiler. Other than that, I don't know how much of a wave Fosse Burden makes, and I get that, but what do you make of FX's sort of deflated nominations this year? Um, I mean, I think a lot of it came down to came down to the fact that some of their target programming just didn't quite hit. Like they lost the Americans, which is obviously uh, a disappointment for everyone in the world. Yeah. Um, but uh, the fact that better things didn't gain momentum, the fact that when we do in the shadows was too genre to play in the academy, um, the fact that American Horror Story had to shift categories again and you know couldn't quite compete when they needed to. They didn't have an American Crime Story this year. Instead, they did have Fosse Verdon, and Fosse Verdon put up respectable nomination numbers. But I just don't think they had enough horses in the race to 
to actually compete with, with everything else that's out there. We're right. seeing HBO and Netflix just flood the zone with, right. with heavy hitters. So I think that's kind of where it ended up. But I do agree with you on Michelle Williams. I think she's the sleeper in that category. And what's so interesting about that category is how often it's shifted. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, you know, last winter it was Amy Adams versus Patricia Arquette. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are like, it's Amy Adams. Like she's finally going to get her due except on TV instead of film. Then Patty won both the SAG and the Golden Globe, and you're like, okay, it's going to be Patty's. And then, like, it just keeps moving along where Michelle Williams is now a, a huge force. Um, I think that, again, Fosse Verdon has more of, like, a feud season one vibe when it comes Very to, much. like, how it's going to perform in the in the winner's circle. Uh, but the fact that it wrecked in as many nominations as it did should be a, a, at least some comfort to FX. Including Leftovers alum Margaret Qualley. Very happy to see Miss Qualley make it into the race. Yeah. Very well deserving. Another Absolutely. unfortunate snub, though she would have also been a guest actress in season three for The Leftovers, so that would have been a tricky nomination alongside and down. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Tell me where you're li- sitting for comedy then. Because we talked at the opening about Veep versus Barry and how tricky it is, but what about those newcomers? Do they have any heat coming in? Uh, I think Fleabag has a lot of heat. Um, I think that's one where um, you could see it, it make a little bit of a run because it's a show that literally everybody who's seen it tells everybody else they have to watch it. And for once, that burden of like, hey, you have to watch this show hasn't, you know, kind of uh, deflected against them in the sense of like, I don't want, like, stop, shut up. I don't want to watch it right now. Um, so that's been, I think that that's been uh, hugely beneficial to that show. It could make a run. Uh, Russian Doll will have Netflix full backing all to itself, which is uh, a boon for that show. Uh, having Amy Poehler on the circuit, Natasha Leone, Leslie Headland, all of that is, is very helpful for that show. It's also something that feels like, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in season two, so maybe let's honor it right now. Right. Um, but no, I, I think it's going to come down to that kind of trifecta of Marvel's Mrs. Maisel, Barry, and Veep. And I think Veep, despite... The, the long-standing wins and, and solid streak and respect within the community. I honestly think this is Barry's to lose at this point. So um, I love that. I love that. I, I would be so happy with that until, you know, for the next six years when it won consistently. But uh, I would sure love to see Fleabag upset. And I'm a huge Russian Doll fan, too. But yeah. and my I, fingers crossed. I think what's interesting, too, about that side of it is... There are multiple shows that just don't, we don't know what's going to happen to them in the future. So maybe now is the time. We mentioned Russian Doll, but Fleabag is supposedly over. Um, and, and Phoebe Waller-Bridge obviously has a lot of other things to do, so it will at least be a long time before that would be revisited. Right. Veep is actually over, so like right. this is, again, the last chance to honor it, even though it's been honored in, in previous seasons. So it's like, will they feel the pressure to honor something because now is the only time they can do it, or will they just go with, this is the show that I love the most and that you know I really, really want to vote for. So Right, right. And then Game of Thrones wins drama series. Game of Thrones is going to win. And that's the entire thing. Yes, yes. That was good. I feel like I feel like that was a really fun journey through the nominations with you. I'm very the excited end was to see. Disappointing. Well, uh, the, at least it's consistent. At least, at least there's at least there's something you know going into the night we don't have to worry about. We're just yeah. like, well, it's gonna happen. We'll yeah. all get through it. Yeah, together. and it'll make the night feel that much shorter. As you know, comedy series awarded, you shut it off, and you, you just, go on with your business. You just go to the parties a little bit early, and it'll be fun. Because you know what? It's gonna disappoint you. Yeah. Either way. They are very strong in their brand. Are you curious about the speech, though? Do you think any sort of controversy will come up whenever someone from Game of Thrones wins and you know they do their peripheral thank yous? Is anybody going to go outside of that realm and try to address the criticism like what happened at Comic-Con? Absolutely not. Oh, like, darn it. no. I hope like, somebody it's does. It's not going to be interesting at all. Somebody's got to have some attitude. Or somebody will win who doesn't expect to, and they'll go up without a speech, and then it'll be like, oh, no, I don't know what to say. Screw the haters, I'm out! And then, that's great. <laughs> if that happens, it's going to be Gwendolyn Christie, and she's going to be oh, effortlessly oh, charming, yeah. just how it was when uh, Merritt Weaver won for Nurse Jackie. Right. And, uh, or, or when she won for that Netflix Western. Godless. Yes. No. Yeah. She is uh, she is a pro at, at giving those surprise speeches, so honestly, that's the best we gonna, can hope for. If anybody's going to convince me that the Game of Thrones season was worth anything, it's going to be Gwendolyn Christie. I know, Christie, right? So... I hope, I mean, I'd love to see her win, but at the same time, I don't I don't want that confusion no. in my life. I no, like I, where I stand. Well, I know. You so, don't want to be challenged. No. Well, not by, not, well, yeah. not by Game oh, of Thrones. Ah, ah. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and on that note, 
we will be back with more Emmy videos in the future. Huh? <laughs>